Hi folks. Um, we want to introduce an interesting um, as biological aspect to you today which relates to how energy is actually stored in the form of ATP and it involves a molecular nanomachine that evolved some billion years ago in bacteria and has also been incorporated into mitochondria. Um, we're going to try to discuss this from a biological point of view using a film that illustrates it rather nicely. And then subsequently, we're going to ask a biologist named Wayne, uh, a, a chemist uh, named Chris, and a physicist uh, named Don to describe the same phenomenon from their points of view. So let's get to it. ATP synthase is an incredible molecular machine spectacular in structure and in function. Using a reservoir of protons, this machine is responsible for producing the majority of the cell's ATP and in photosynthesis, storing light energy in a usable form, ATP. ATP synthase is a molecular machine that works like a turbine to convert the energy stored in a proton gradient into chemical energy stored in the bond energy of ATP. The flow of protons down their electrochemical gradient drives a rotor that lies in the membrane. It is thought that protons flow through an entry open to one side of the membrane and bind to rotor subunits. Only protonated subunits can then rotate into the membrane away from the static channel assembly. Once the protonated subunits have completed an almost full circle and have returned to the static subunits, an exit channel allows them to leave to the other side of the membrane. In this way, the energy stored in the proton gradient is converted into mechanical rotational energy. The rotational energy is transmitted via a shaft attached to the rotor that penetrates deep into the center of the characteristic lollipop head, the F1 ATPase, which catalyzes the formation of ATP. The F1 ATPase portion of ATP synthase has been crystallized. Its molecular structure shows that the position of the central shaft influences the conformation and arrangement of the surrounding subunits. It is these changes that drive the synthesis of ATP from ADP. In this animated model, different conformational states are lined up as a temporal sequence as they would occur during rotation of the central shaft. Like any enzyme, ATP synthase can work in either direction. If the concentration of ATP is high and the proton gradient low, ATP synthase will run in reverse, hydrolyzing ATP as it pumps protons across the membrane. To show the rotation of the central shaft, a short fluorescent actin filament was experimentally attached to it. Single filaments attached to single F1 ATPases can be visualized in the microscope. When ATP is added, the filament starts spinning, directly demonstrating the mechanical properties of this remarkable molecular machine. In cells, organic molecules such as carbohydrates, fats, and proteins are not only used as cellular building blocks, but can be used as a source of cellular energy. The majority of that energy comes not from breaking carbon to carbon bonds, as it does when paper is burnt, but from hydrogens contained in the organic molecules. The more hydrogens, the more potential energy for the cell.
As far as energy is concerned, we can think of organic molecules as hydrogen suitcases. Through cellular processes like glycolysis and the Krebs cycle, hydrogens are stripped from molecules, the electrons and protons are separated and run through the electron transport chain using oxygen as the driving force. This creates a proton gradient on one side of the inner mitochondrial membrane into the outer compartment of the mitochondria, with the waste products of this activity being water. The proton gradient, like water stored behind a dam, represents potential energy which can be used to run the ATP synthase machine. As protons flow through the machine from the outer compartment into the inner compartment, like flowing water turning a water wheel, they provide a source of mechanical energy used to combine ADP and phosphate to make ATP. The chemical steps and structures are not fully understood yet, but research is pointing in the direction of the following description. ADP and phosphate are joined to form ATP in a three-step process occurring in the F1 complex. The picture shows that the F1 complex has alternating alpha and beta sections, and that there is a binding site between those sections. Two sites are shown, the third is on the back. The binding sites open and close in a repetitive sequence of shapes or conformations. In the open form, ADP and phosphate are attracted, enter, and stick. Since the ADP and phosphate contain negatively charged oxygen atoms, they are held in place by positively charged sites on the protein, in particular arginine and lysine amino acid side chains, which, has a, which have a positively charged nitrogen-containing groups. Intermolecular forces like these control the movement and position of atoms throughout the process that leads to ATP formation. The strongest factors are electrostatic attraction, positive site to negative site, and hydrogen bonds. That's when a hydrogen atom, covalently bound to one oxygen or nitrogen atom, is attracted by polarity to another nearby oxygen or nitrogen atom. The next conformation in the sequence is called the loose binding form, which closes around the ADP and phosphate, holding them in place. A close-up view shows how the end phosphate on ADP and the phosphate are positioned. Note that phosphorus atoms are shown in blue. The third conformation is called tight binding form. Compression of this site promotes the joining of the end oxygen on ADP to the phosphorus atom in the phosphate ion. This forms a trigonal bipyramid transition state and pushes an oxygen off the phosphorus to form a water molecule. The transition state is stabilized again because positively charged arginine and lysine amino acids in the surrounding protein are attracted to all those negatively charged oxygen atoms in ADP and phosphate. The blue atoms show the position of those positive charges. The cycle completes when the site opens up into the open form again. A key arginine group moves away from the now formed ATP, preventing the transition state from reforming and thus preventing ATP from converting back to ADP. This weakened attraction allows ATP to release from the binding site. How is it that the binding site forms change? The binding site changes conformations because of the molecular stalk, called the gamma part of the complex, that rotates around the central axis of the F1 complex. The stalk consists of a double-stranded braid of alpha helix protein. As this braid turns, the surrounding material experiences a periodic push and release. This causes the adjacent alpha and beta portions of the structure to move. That conformational change carries through to the binding sites, causing the subtle changes in the positions of the molecular pieces there. From the physics perspective, we want to focus on energy and forces. The big picture is that the chemical energy in our food is transformed into the chemical energy in ATP. But this is not a simple process at all. The first stages are glycolysis and the Krebs cycle. Next, the electron transport chain moves the protons across the mitochondrial membrane, so there are more protons in the outer compartment than the inner compartment. This stores energy in the form of what is known as electrical potential energy. 
This potential energy is then used to turn the rotor made of the C-ring and the gamma stalk, which in turn exerts a force on the F1 complex, and that results in the conformational changes required to make ATP. To make this more understandable, we can draw an analogy with a water wheel. The electron transport chain is like a person carrying buckets of water up a hill. Because the water experiences a downward force due to gravity, moving it upwards takes energy. So the chemical energy of the person is converted into gravitational potential energy of the water. Next, the water is released. Since it experiences a downward gravitational force, it speeds up and increases its kinetic energy. The water then hits one of the paddles of the wheel, making it turn. But so far, this whole process has not done any useful work. A water wheel is useful because it in turn makes something else move. For example, the turning water wheel may be connected to a mechanical element that grinds grain. In terms of forces, the water wheel exerts a force on the wheel in one direction, and the grinders exert a force in the other direction. In addition, friction will also exert a force that slows down the water wheel. As long as the force exerted by the water wheel exceeds the force from the grinders and friction, the wheel will keep turning and the grinders will continue to do useful work. Looking at this process in terms of energy, the chemical energy in the person is converted into gravitational potential energy of the water, which is then converted into kinetic energy of the water and the wheel and the grinders, as well as work done by the grinders on the grain. Finally, the energy ends up as thermal energy in the wheel and the grain. This is where the analogy breaks down, because unlike an ATP synthase, the energy is not stored, so it can't be useful somewhere else. Instead, the outcome in this system is edible grain and heat. Now we turn to the energy and forces picture of ATP synthase. The chemical energy in our food is used to move the protons across the mitochondrial membrane. This takes energy because the protons repel one another, so a proton being moved through the membrane experiences a force opposite to their motion. The energy from our food is now transformed into the electrical potential energy of the protons. When the protons flow through the half channel into the C-ring, the electrical potential energy becomes kinetic energy of the rotor. While the details here are more complex than for the water wheel, we do know that electrical forces are essential to making the rotor turn. Also, just as the grinder exerts a force on the water wheel, the F1 complex exerts a force on the rotor in the direction opposite to the force from the protons. As long as the force on the rotor by the protons is greater than the force exerted by the F1 complex, the rotor will move in the direction that allows for synthesis of ATP. So in terms of energy, the chemical energy of our food is converted into electrical potential energy, which is then turned into kinetic energy of the rotor and the work done by the rotor on the F1 complex to create conformational changes. And lastly, the energy is transformed into the chemical energy in ATP.